you know, there's boxing fans and then real boxing fans. So, But it was great to have these champs come through. We were able to raise some funds to run for hope. So whoever's in first place, I think it's Mega Man. Mega Skinny Man. Losing weight. Uh, I'm gunning for you, man. L- look for me. Amen. Look over your shoulder. I'm coming for first place in this church. Come on, somebody. I, I got to do my part. I know I'm the pastor, but I mean, we got to lead the way. Amen. So I'm doing my part. Isaiah chapter 40, beginning in verse 28. And I want to preach a message I think is appropriate for our theme today. It says, do you not know? Have you not heard? In verse 28. The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. Look at this. He will not grow tired or weary. I mean, that's good news. And his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even the youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But look at this. It says, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. One portion says those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Watch this. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run for hope. Oh, it doesn't say that. Amen. They will run and not grow weary. Look at this. They will walk and shall not faint. Before you, before you get into this word, tell your neighbor, don't faint on me. In the theme of our Sunday, we're, we're emphasizing run for hope. I want to talk to you a little bit about the power walk. The power walk. I want you to know that as we read this scripture, the Bible is pretty clear that God, he gives us power. But how many know the power of the Holy Ghost is not just so that we can have an experience. In fact, the Bible says that we receive the Holy Spirit so that we can be endued with power. Try, try saying it. Say, say power. I think this is so vital because, you know, you see many who are in the house of God, might even be here this morning, many Christians who are more uh, what you would call experience-orientated Christians. They go from one experience to another in a sense that it's almost like they're event-driven. They've got to have an event. They've got to have some type of experience to be able to stay alive. But how many know the power of God is so much more than that? The power of the Holy Ghost doesn't take you from experience to experience. But actually, while some are experience orientated, there are some people that are also relationally minimized. And guess what? The good news is we get to have a relationship with the Holy Ghost. See, I want you to know that everyone has experienced God. Every, everyone, many of us know people that they've had an experience with God. Even some of us, we, we say today, I'm having an experience with God. Or everyone's experienced church. But I want you to know that to know God, it's much more than just a Sunday morning experience or just a Christian face. I want you to look at your neighbor and tell them, this is not a face. Christianity is not a face. It's not like that time that you tried to be a skater. Come on now, and you went and bought some board shorts and a skater t-shirt, and, and you really were just a poser. <laughs> it's not like that time when you were a heavy metal person. Come on, somebody. You grew your hair long. Motley Crue, you wore the rocker shirt. Come on, somebody. You had the makeup on. No, I'm just kidding. It's not a face. I came to tell you Christianity is not a face. How many know if we're going to serve God, we can serve Jesus all the days of our life and we can walk in the power of the Holy Ghost. It's not just an experience, but even though as I'm saying this, how many know God does give us some experiences? In fact, if you read Isaiah chapter 40, God allows for us to have experiences. There will be experiences. We'll, as In the Christian life, we call these those mountaintop experiences. I want to bring out a few things here in Isaiah 40 that I believe we can also have. Is the Bible teaches us that there will be those times of renewal. There will be those times where God's power will renew you. How many some, you know sometimes we need that? And God in his love allows us to experience his power that is able to not only renew us, but also to refresh us. 
There are going to be those seasons of your life, brothers and sisters, where you feel stronger. There's going to be those seasons of your life where you say, you know, I'm walking stronger today than I was yesterday. There are going to be those seasons of your life where you're more vibrant, where you're more happy, where you're more excited about the things of God. There are going to be those times in your walk with God where you do feel more alive. You're going to be able to say, man, I feel alive, more alive today than I did yesterday. I feel more excited today than I did yesterday because God always allows for those different times of renewal. Also, according to Isaiah 40, we find that God also provides times where we soar like an eagle. I mean, it's pretty obvious, it's clear that God's power will allow you to soar sometimes. There are going to be those times in our walk with God where we will soar. There will be those times where we're doing great things for him. There's going to be times where we can really look at our life and say, you know what? I'm, I'm soaring right now. I, I'm soaring. And how many know it's okay? There's going to be those times where you preach a message and you're going to be like, you know what, man? That was a good message. Come on now. That's the best message I've ever preached. Talk to me now. There's going to be times where you sing a song and you're going to be hitting notes that you're going to say, I sound good. <laughs> you know, you're going to be doing well. Someone say doing well. Because when you're doing well, you're soaring like an eagle. There's going to be those times where you're going to be blessed. You're going to feel like you're winning. You're going to feel like you're doing great things. Your, your life is way up. In fact, people are going to look at you, and they're going to look at your life. and going to say, your life to them looks like a sign and a wonder. They're going to say, man, look at the great season you are in. Look at the great time you are in. Look at how God has been good to your life. And they're going to say to themselves, wouldn't it be nice for me to also do some of the things you are doing. And I tell you, when you're soaring like an eagle, it seems like everything in your life is clicking. Who, who's ever been there? Okay, some of you need to go there, but who's been there? Where it just seems like everything was working, everything was clicking, you even looked better, you even smelled better. Come on, somebody. You just walked different because you were soaring like an eagle. So there's gonna be those times where you have renewal, those times where you begin to soar like an eagle. And then according to this scripture, there's going to be those times where you're actually running. Where you're running for God. See, the Bible says that this is a race, right? You know, we're involved in a race, right? And in a race, you know, it's pretty standard procedure that you ought to run. I, I think you should look at your neighbor. Say, you know what? You ought to run. <laughs> at, at some point, you ought to run. At some point, you should be able to run. You should be able to move at a certain pace, a certain speed. I think that's what we're all trying to get to, isn't it? There's some times where we ought to run. The Bible says we should run. And what happens when you're running well? This is what happens. Watch. When you're running well, people are cheering you on. I've been to some races. I've been to the Boston Marathon. Different, and you know, and you're, at, you're on the sideline and you see your runner coming. And as you see them, what do you do? You start to hey, you have your side. Hey, look at, hey, go, go, run. Run faster. Come on, somebody. I don't know what you're just cheering. Run. Look at you run. All the training, all the time you put into the gym, all the work you've done, right? And now you're running and people are cheering you on. And, and how many know it feels good to be cheered on? How many know it feels good to, to, to have people cheering for you? We love it when people cheer us on. In fact, when we're, when we're being cheered on, it, you know, it, it seems like to bring out the best in us. It feels good sometimes to be in the spotlight. It feels good sometimes to be the center of attention. I, I remember I had this really great experience. Uh, and I've had all these different experiences, but I had this really great experience. It wouldn't be where you thought. It was at my daughter's birthday party, Samara. And it was a while back, and she had this pizza party. Some of you might have remembered you there. And uh, there was a lot of people. And we're at the pizza place, and they had this boxing thing like a machine had like a bag a punching bag on it and you punch it as hard as you can and it gives you a score so all the guys kind of started gravitating toward that punching bag right and then we're looking and then you know one of the guys said, okay you go first and boom he hit it and his score card ring 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 starts it makes a noise and then the score's going up and it got attention the attention of the sisters
so then the sisters, you know, they're looking like, you know, oh, look at the guys are punching the bag. You know, who's the strongest man? You know, that brings something out in the guy. Come on, somebody. So they all start gathering, making their way over to the punching bag. And there's starting to be a crowd. And one by one, the guys, they start, come on, now it's your turn. Boom. And the score goes, okay. And then, well, I could do better. Boom. And so then it was my turn. You know? And I pulled back. And everybody's looking at me like, oh, shoot, can he do it? Is he going to, is he going to, you know? And boom, I hit the bag. And the mm-hmm. score goes up, it's going, it's gone. And it was, it passed everybody. I was the strongest man <laughs> for that day. <laughs> I won the day. And how many know it feels good to win the day? And sometimes we're going to be in those seasons where we're winning. We're going to be in those seasons when we're in the spotlight. We're going to be in those seasons when we're running strong. But I came to tell you something this morning is that none of that intimidates the enemy. Satan knows there's seasons when we're going to soar. Satan knows that there's going to be seasons when we're doing better than we've ever done, but it really doesn't scare the enemy. The enemy is not intimidated by people who can only operate in the spotlight. (laughs) Satan is not intimidated by people that can only operate on the platform, only operate in a good season, only operate on the mountaintop. I'll tell you why. Because Satan took high school physics, and he knows what you know, that what goes up, Oh, you ain't saying nothing to me today. What goes up eventually must comes down. But you know what really does scare the enemy? It's not the people that can operate on the mountaintop, but it's the people that can operate in the valley. I'm going to need you to get a little bit excited. What scares the devil is when you're not in the spotlight and you're still praying. You're not in the spotlight and you're still battling. You're not in the spotlight and you're still serving. Come on. You're still believing. You're still walking by faith and not by feeling. Come on, somebody. That's when the devil gets nervous. Oh, I got a feeling that I got about maybe a hundred people in here that right now you're getting the devil real nervous because it's not your season. You're not in the spotlight. You're going through some trouble, but you're still walking. You may not be running, but you're walking. You may not be sprinting, but you're still going forward. Tell your neighbor, don't you dare faint now. Everybody cheers the runners, but nobody cheers walkers. Especially guys who speed walk. There is something that is very unattractive about a man walking and moving his hips side to side. I won't even do it because I don't want to I don't want to put that on YouTube. Can I hear an amen? Nobody cheers a walker, but we serve a God that'll cheer a walker, a God that'll cheer a man or a woman that'll walk in the valley. He says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for God will comfort me. Can Victory Outreach San Diego stand to your feet and shout for a walker, shout for someone who's committed to God? Touch two people, tell them, I like how you walk. Just don't shake your hips, brothers. Do I got any walkers in the house? Let me tell you guys, and and I'm not going to preach on, but can I get this out? I feel I'm on assignment to encourage somebody. You're going to have your ups, you're going to have your downs. You're going to have your seasons where where David, he understood the high season of defeating the giants. He took that Philistine down, didn't he? He was anointed with all. David had his victories. David also had his defeats. He knew what it was to be anointed king to kill Goliath, but he also knew what it was to suffer defeat at the hands of the Philistines. A defeat that was so horrible that his own men wanted to kill him. His own mighty men of valor plotted against him to kill him because their families were taken and they suffered a great loss. But what did David do? Oh, The Bible says in that dark time, he took the linen ephod of prayer 
and he put it around and he put it in his breastplate actually and he began to separate and he began to talk to God the Bible says he began to encourage himself in the Lord what do you do when you don't have anybody cheering you on what do you do when you don't have anybody in your corner what do you do when it seems like all you can do is cry and weep what you got to do is get in your prayer closet and you've got to encourage yourself in the Lord and when he encouraged himself in the Lord, that's when the Lord said to him, go and overtake the enemy. I got to tell you something. Your season is coming where you're going to overtake the enemy and take back everything the devil has stolen. Every great leader has had their highs and their lows. The prophet Elijah, he knew the high of, of, of calling down the rain and stopping the heavens and stopping the rain and then calling the rain back and he knew the, the power but then he knew the, the high of you know killing 400 prophets of Baal but then he also understood the, the pain and the tiredness and the weakness that comes after a great battle that all it took was a woman by the name of Jezebel to say, by tell you, she didn't even, you know, it was a little threat. By tomorrow, I'm going to kill you. You know, and, and it's just enough to put him in a tailspin. See, I got to tell you, sometimes ministry's not easy. You know the excitement of preaching, the excitement of running a Bible study, the excitement of doing a campus, the excitement of ministering in song, and, and you have those highs. But sometimes when it's all said and done, you go home and you know the, the pain and, and of having a, of a body that's frail. You know the pain of being tired. You know the pain of feeling like no one heard you preach. You know the pain of saying, man, you know, things are not that good in my life, but I came to tell you God is faithful to pull you out of that pit and pull you out of that depression. In Elijah's situation, the Lord sent him a messenger and he says, rise up and eat. And, that, and sometimes when you're low, that's what you got to do. You've got to rise up and eat. You got to eat the promises of God. You got to eat the word of God. You got to eat the presence of God. You got to just take it all in and let the Lord begin to strengthen you. Come on, clap for the Lord. Amen. Clap for the Lord. Clap. Come on. Here's what I want to tell you, Victor Outreach San Diego. Hear this statement and hear it clear. Don't be the type of people that only relate with mountaintop Christianity. Don't only relate with the hype of ministry, the hype of church life. The, oh, it's happening over here. It's happening over there. Listen, brothers and sisters, if you want to be the real deal, I, I, want, a, I want a church that can relate not just with the mountaintop. I want a church that can relate with the valley. I want a church that can relate with the struggle. I want a people that can relate with tough times that still serve God when others are pulling out of the race. Are you hearing me today? See, you know what scares the devil is a people that know how to walk. Why am I still here today? I've been serving God 25 years. Why am I still here? I've given my youngest years to the Lord, my best years to the Lord, the years where I looked the best. All went to Jesus. Why am I still here? Because I've learned to walk with God. There's those times to run, but I've learned you're not always going to run. Why am I still married today? 22 years of marriage. Thank God. That's a miracle. Marriage is a miracle, isn't it? And I still love my wife more today than the first day that I met her. And we still have fun together and we do ministry together. Isn't it great? And she looks gorgeous. Why, though? Because I've learned to walk with her. We've both learned to walk with her. Why am I still doing ministry with the energy? I don't have to move at this pace. I don't have to preach every Sunday. I don't have to. I preached Wednesday, Sunday, was in L.A., did a fundraiser, conference, fellowship. I mean, you know, I need a clone at this point. There needs to be two of me. And why do I still do it? I don't have to do it. 
but the reason I do it is because I've learned to tap in to the power of the Holy Ghost in my life. I've learned to understand that it's not just an experience, but God gives us the power to live a lifestyle. Come on, somebody. I think that's what the Holy Ghost is saying to you. This doesn't have to be a surface thing. This doesn't have to be from event to event, but this could be a lifestyle where you walk in power, where you walk in victory, where you walk in purpose. I feel we need to learn how to walk. I want to just break it down very quick and send you home. W, worship God at all times. Walk in a, a perpetual state of worship. Always be worshiped. Do we have any worshipers in the house? Yeah? Always be worshiping. Worship. Don't just worship. Worship when you get home. Worship in the car. Worship, 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 and worship some more. You know that worship neutralizes the enemy. You know, Satan can't get the best of a worshiper. Do you know that it is virtually impossible to worship and be defeated simultaneously? Did you know that? Have you ever tried to praise God and be defeated simultaneously? It doesn't work. It, you know, this is the day that the Lord has made. I'm off key. I will rejoice and be glad and they get out of my face, devil. For oh, this is the day, devil, you're a punk, that the Lord, that you're a liar, devil, has made. Come on, you can't have the victory and be defeated simultaneously. You can't praise God and be defeated. Some of you need to keep worshiping, keep praising, keep loving God, keep singing to the Lord and watch how things shift. Someone say worship. No matter what you face, keep praising God. Let the devil know that no matter what I go through, you cannot have my worship. You can attack my body. You can attack my family. You can attack my money. You can attack my ministry. In fact, you can take it all away, but what you can't take is the song out of my mouth. You can't take my worship. You can't take my praise even if i only got one outfit in the closet i'm still going to worship god i'm still going to praise god because if you take my praise you can take my salvation but if you take my belongings and i keep my praise my praise will bring all my belongings back it will bring my family back it will bring my ministry you can't have my praise you can't have my church attendance i don't care if i gotta limp into the house of god I'm going to worship the Lord. The second thing is attitude. How many want to learn to walk? Attitude. We need to have the right attitude, the right attitude, the right attitude. Not this funky, grumpy, hard look. So many Christians are in the house of God and you're trying to be hard. Why are you trying to be hard? You know the Bible actually says the Lord despises a hard look. A proud heart and a hard look. The Lord despises that. Why do we have women you're trying to look hard? Some of y'all scare me. Just looking at me all hard. We need the right attitude. Philippians 2 5 says, Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Romans 12 1 says, Be ye transformed by the renewing. Come on, somebody, the renewing of our mind. See, God not only wants us to change our heart, He wants us to change our mind. Keep a positive attitude in all seasons, brothers and sisters. Listen to me, man. Keep a positive attitude, talk positive. No matter what negative is going in your life, stay positive. You know, we grew up, our mom told us, our grandparents told us, listen, if you have nothing nice to say, <laughs> you, you know what I'm talking about. Don't say nothing at all. Zip it. Shut your mouth. Shut up in Jesus' name. Sew your lips together. Get duct tape. Don't talk negative over your life. 
Don't talk negative over your family. Don't talk negative over your health. Don't talk negative about brothers and sisters. I don't care what they've done to you. Just say, mmm. Those old church mothers back in the day would just say, mmm. Mmm. Am I doing it right? Should I go, mmm. And I think what it is is that they had something negative to say. They didn't like how that sister was acting. They didn't like how their kids were acting. They didn't like how their husband was treating them. But they just said, mmm. They must have took some tape and put it over their mouth and said, I refuse to have the wrong attitude. I'm going to worship God in the good seasons and in all. I'm preaching better than you're shouting. I'm going to worship the Lord in the good seasons and in the bad. Mm-hmm. Say, hey, neighbor, stay positive. Let me tell you, you know. Many times we walk alone because we walk in the wrong spirit, the wrong attitude. You see, if you're you're negative and you're talking negative and you're walking negative, then no wonder nobody wants to walk with you. Is that too real? And, And no one wants to walk with you. The crowd begins to diminish. Why? Because, you know... I've made the mistake. I have a tendency sometimes to have negative traits in my life, say negative things. And when I'm around a lot of positive people, which I am a lot, you know, just like the other day, I just said something and just, you know, came out. You know, usually when you're tired, you're negative. And how many know once the toothpaste comes out of the tube, you can't put the toothpaste back in. It's out. (laughs) Yeah, It came out, and then they all gave me this look like, you all right buddy that doesn't seem normal but thank God for grace but if I continue to walk negative pretty soon I'm going to find myself by myself and I, I'll tell you man if you're going to step into your new season you got to take a look at your attitude how many receive that point stay, stay connected to the ones that talk positive Stay connected to the ones that are positive in negative seasons, positive in tough times. Come on, somebody. Thirdly, live on purpose. I'm almost done. Live on purpose. Live on target. Understand why you walk. Understand that you're not ordinary. You're not average. You're not, you're not supposed to be like everybody else. You know that God has called you, he's chosen you, he's given you a purpose, he's given you a destiny. He wants to give you a powerful life. Do you understand why God saved you? Do you understand this? Do you understand the depths of reasons to why God saved you? For for some reason, God saw things in us that we could not see in ourselves, And he chose us for a purpose. And, And I believe it's because God wants to use you to break many generational curses in your family I I, I declare divorce cursed in your family I declare poverty cursed in your family I declare sickness and addiction and bondage cursed in your family once and for all because God has chosen you to walk in purpose walk in destiny walk in oh come on walk in vision we got to stay on track But many Christians, they contract this disease in their life. It's the disease of ease. And it's like a virus, man. Tell your neighbor, it's like a virus. Disease of ease is like a virus, boy. Let me tell you, man, you know, as as long as things aren't going good, you're battling. But when things start going well, the disease of ease tries to creep up. And I'll tell you, it's contagious. And if we, if we have to walk in purpose, we have to understand the responsibility of that, that we don't only affect our life, we affect the lives of others. People are watching us. Sometimes you think, no one's watching me. Nobody's watching me. You know, when you're in a low season, you're not in the spotlight. No one's watching me. No one cares about me. My decisions don't matter. 
Where I go doesn't matter. Whether I go to church, don't go to church, doesn't matter because no one's watching me. But I came to reverse that and tell you, many people are watching. More than you know are watching you. Your brothers and sisters in the church are watching you. Your kids are watching. Your family members are watching you. I came to tell you, if you're a leader, you have a responsibility to walk on target. But when, unfortunately, when you get off track, others will get off track with you. That's why this is so critical. That's why we have to count the cost of this journey and understand that we have a responsibility, not just to ourselves, but how many know we have a responsibility to other people? I walk with purpose because I recognize that people are watching me. They're watching everything about me. They're watching what I say. They're watching how I live. They're watching who I talk to, who I walk with, who I work with, how I dress, how I speak. And let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. I am not perfect. But I think it's the fact that I'm not perfect that keeps me before God. It's the fact that I have so many personal insecurities, personal frailties, personal issues that I cannot detach myself from the house of God. I can't detach myself from the people of God. I can't detach myself from the altar of God. Am I speaking true to anybody? Because when you have a purpose, I have to be here. I have to do what God has called me to do. I have to serve. Come on. See, brothers and sisters, I can't afford to slack off one bit. Because y'all don't know me. I can do bad all by myself. <laughs> I don't need no help to go back to the world. And you think that pastors can't go back to the world? Shoot. I could do bad all by myself. And you know what? You could do bad all by yourself too. So I got to stay here. When I walk into this place, I sit right there now. It's my new seat over there. I don't like it, but that's where I'm sitting right now. That's where I'm at. And I come in there, and the music's playing, and, the, and you all are worshiping. You guys are worshiping in the back row of worship. I walk in here after a long ministry trip. Oh, my God. It's like drinking water, the freshest water, the coldest, with, you know, the, doesn't need no ice cubes, just fresh from the mountaintop. It feeds my soul. I feel the strength of the Holy Ghost those wings begin to spread and even if it be for two hours I begin to soar like an eagle and God begins to remind me I'm still with you I still called you you may not feel a hundred percent but don't lose heart because I still got a plan for your life I'm going in on some of you and you're fighting me because God is trying to let you know he's not done with you yet he's just getting started don't lose hearts. In fact, touch someone right now as they come. Tell them, don't lose hearts. Don't lose heart. You're going to run sometimes? But honestly, 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 can I talk to you? Most of the time, you're going to walk. Even sometimes, just like some of you right now, you're going to crawl. You're going to crawl. But I got some good news, man. At least you're still going forward. At least you're going forward. That's real Christianity. Tell your neighbor, that's real Christianity. It's not the spotlight stuff. It's serving God in the valley. It's walking in integrity, walking like a man of God, walking like a woman of God. Ooh, it's keeping a good attitude when everything in your life says your attitude should stink. 
It's you making a choice to give him praise. It's you making a choice to serve him with all your heart. It's you making a, making a choice to serve other people. I don't feel good, but I'm going to serve other people. I'm tired, but you know what, man? I'm a real Christian, so I'm going to serve you. Can we preach like that here? And then the K is to know the power of God. And I got to tell you, to know the power of God what's helped me all these years to walk with God is we have to strive to stay pure. We have to strive to stay pure as vessels before the Lord. How many of you have a desire to stay pure before God? I'll end with this. There was a man. His name was Peter Jenkins. In the 1970s, he literally walked across the whole United States went through a tremendous divorce and his heart was broken he lost his purpose so he went on a journey crazy journey he took his little dog who was his best friend how many of the dogs are loyal man god bless dogs they're gonna go to dog heaven and he started to walk he first walked down to the south and then walk cross country. Determine he'd work on the way. He'd earn his keep just with a backpack on his feet. But as he made the journey, and it took him a year to walk across the whole country, many things happened to him, as you could imagine. He was injured. He was he got stuck in the mountains for a whole winter. He got hit by a car. He was stabbed. He worked all these odd jobs and then ultimately his faithful dog was killed. But after a year, along that journey, he said two things. He said one thing. He says, by walking across the country, I had lost faith in people. But I've come to realize that there are still good people in this country. People that served me, helped me get from point A to point B. He discovered a lot. They asked him this. They said, of all the challenges you faced in this journey, what was the worst thing? The worst thing that could happen to you? So you were stabbed, your dog was killed, you were robbed, you were beaten, you were in the cold. What was the worst thing that you went through? He says, the worst thing I went through was the times when I couldn't get rocks out of my shoes. That was the worst. There'd be a rock in there, I couldn't get it out. And I'd have to walk, but I was walking in pain because my shoes weren't clean. And I came to tell you, brothers and sisters, we don't have to live dirty lives anymore. to live compromised. We don't have to live defeated. We can be cleansed. God can literally take your shoe and get all the rocks out of it. How many want to know the power of God? And every day we got to get up in the morning and say, Lord, get the rocks out. Lord, cleanse me. Give me a new chance. Lord, I want your anointing. I believe there's people here right now that you've been struggling. And you know what you need? You need what this scripture says. You need the power of God to cause you to rise up on eagles. And it'll come if you're willing to let God get those rocks out of your shoes. You're willing to let him put his praise in your mouth. Bring you around those positive people. Tell me you want to be a great walker for them. Amen. Let's stand and let me pray for you. And if you say this message was for me, Pastor, I want to come to the altar and spend some time with the Lord. If you haven't been serving the Lord, I want you to come to this altar. I'm going to lead you in the sinner's prayer. But I want you to come. And I believe as you come, He's going to renew your strength.